The last thing that I want to talk about today is a mention of, of effect sizes. So again, I've mentioned effect sizes briefly in, in sort of conceptual detail before, but not actual practical detail. And this is one of the things that I'm going to talk about introduced here, but then we're going to talk about it again for each of the weeks subsequently for the rest of the session. So effect sizes are very useful things to interpret and to report because effect sizes give us an idea of how big a particular effect is. And that effect could be a difference between the means of the two groups, or it could be how big the mean difference score is in terms of the t-test that we've talked about so far. So if I said that there was a difference in the amount of time that women versus men spend doing housework, how big is that actual difference in time? Is it, is it a matter of, say, 15 minutes on average, or is it a matter of three hours on average? So the size of the effect is actually giving us a sense of how big the difference between the groups is. There's lots of different kinds of effect sizes that we can calculate, um, and we're going to be talking about a number of different ones throughout the rest of the session. Um, and we can also talk about effect sizes in terms of standardised effect sizes or unstandardised effect sizes. And I'll go into more detail about that throughout the rest of the session. But generally speaking, standardised effect sizes um, are things where they're in a standard unit of measurement, like the Cohen's D that I'm going to talk about over the next couple of slides. Whereas unstandardised effect sizes are things that aren't in a standardised unit of measurement. They're in the raw unit of measurement that the variable itself is in. And as I said before, effect sizes are very, very useful things to interpret and to focus on, really more important than the statistical significance, because effect sizes can give us a sense of how important a particular effect is. So if I was looking at, say, a CBT intervention on people with anxiety, how big is that decrease in anxiety? How much does their anxiety change as a result of the intervention? And in particular, if we're talking about areas of applied psychology or applied science, thinking about how big an effect is, is a really useful thing for us to be able to um, use that information to see whether, say, an intervention is worthwhile or not, to see whether one type of therapy is better than a different type of therapy, um, to see if we're actually having a meaningful effect on people's lives. It's a really useful thing to be able to kind of identify the usefulness in a sense of the thing that we're investigating and often that's quite different to the statistical significance of an effect and I'm going to show you an example of that in a couple of slides time so let's say that I told you that if you attend PAL sessions for PSYC 105 you are likely to improve your grade compared to people who didn't attend PAL sessions and what if I told you that the size of the improvement in the grade was an average of two points. So rather than getting, say, a 65 on PSYC 105, you could get a 67 instead in your final mark. You might think that that's not a very big impact. That's not a very big difference in your score. A two-point score in terms of a 100-point scale um, isn't very big. Whereas if I said to you that if you attend PAL sessions, you could improve your, your, you're likely to improve your score by 10 points on average. So rather than getting a 65, you could get a 75. That's a much bigger difference. It's a much bigger effect. So you might be more likely to attend PAL sections if you think that the likelihood of the payoff is going to be a bigger payoff compared to a smaller payoff. And that's the kind of information that effect sizes can um, be used for. Okay, so the first type of effect size I'm going to talk about is Cohen's D. This is a measure of a standardised effect size, um, and it's one way of representing a between-group difference or a within-group difference if we're talking about a repeat measures design. So this is looking at group differences in particular, um, and specifically it's looking at how big the difference between the groups is expressed in standard deviation units. So is there on average a one standard deviation difference between the groups, a half a standard deviation difference between the groups? This is the formula for Cohen's D. Um, and you can see that it's just looking at the mean score for group one minus the mean score for group two divided by the standard deviation, the pooled standard deviation, the formula for which is there. And this might actually look a little bit familiar to you because this is actually a really similar concept to what we were talking about with Z scores back in week five. And I was talking about Z scores as a way of representing a particular person's score in terms of how different it is from an average score represented in standard deviation units. And it's actually the same thing here. It's the same concept, except that we're representing the difference between two groups rather than comparing one person's score to the average. 
The sine of Cohen's D is completely unimportant. All it's doing is representing the direction of which group is subtracted from the other group, just like the t-test I was talking about before. And when we, re when we report Cohen's D, we tend to report it in absolute values, i.e. just get rid of the negative sign if we calculated a negative score. So it doesn't matter at all that whether it's positive or negative. And Cohen's D can range from zero all the way up to infinity. It doesn't have an upper bound, but the bigger the value, the bigger the effect is. So we've got some rules of thumb for what's a small versus a medium versus a large effect. These rules of thumb are really to be taken with a grain of salt, and I'm going to be talking about this in more detail in future weeks. Um, but um, they, they use, they're, they're there to be used to guide your interpretation, but not to be the be-all and end-all of your interpretation. So generally speaking, if your effect size is less than 0.2, it's generally a negligible effect. It's kind of a nothing particularly there effect. If it's 0.2, if it's between 0.2 and 0.5, it's considered a small effect. If it's between 0.5 and 0.8, it's considered a medium-sized effect. And if it's bigger than 0.8, it's generally considered to be a large effect. So the bigger the value, the bigger the Cohen's D, the bigger the difference between the groups is. And remember that that actual unit of measurement there is expressed in standard deviation units. So I'm going to go back to one of the examples from last week, our independent samples t-test example, um, just to calculate the effect size for that particular test. So this is a screenshot um, of some of the output that I showed you last week. And we said here um, we were looking at um, the intellect rating of candidates who were applying for a job, and it was looking to see if there's an effect of hearing their skills in terms of the audio condition versus um, actually reading their skills written out in the transcript condition. So what we can see here is that the outcome variable itself, what we saw last week was that the dependent variable, the outcome variable, intellect rating, is on a 10-point scale, ranges from 1 to 10. And you can see just by looking at the descriptive statistics that there's on average a two-point difference between the two groups, i.e. the intellect rating was about two points higher in the audio condition compared to the transcript condition. So a two-point difference on a 10-point scale is actually a reasonably sized effect. It's a reasonably reasonable sized difference. It's kind of one-fifth of the scale, the difference between the groups, two out of 10. But if we wanted to formalize the size of that effect, we could use the Cohen's D calculator, um, the particular formula there to do so for us. So if I plug the numbers into our formula, then I end up with a Cohen's D of 1.1, and that represents a large effect. So we could interpret that as um, the difference in the intellect rating between the audio condition and the transcript condition is quite large. There's quite a large difference. There's on average 1.1 standard deviations difference um, of intellect rating between those two groups. So we can use effect sizes to help us interpret how big the difference is. If I was just to make that comment as I made earlier about the two point mean difference, going back there, if I was just to make the comment that I made earlier about the two point mean difference, then that's using an unstandardized measure of an effect. So talking about the raw difference in means, it's still measuring the effect, it's still representing how big the effect is. It's just using an unstandardized way of doing so. So you have to understand what the scale is of the dependent variable in order to understand if a two point difference is big or is not big. If it was a 10 point scale, a two point difference is quite large. If it was a 100 point scale, a two point difference is nothing. So that's unstandardized effect sizes as opposed to doing something like calculating Cohen's D, which is calculating a standardized effect size that's expressed not in the raw unit of measurement, but in standard deviation units. I'm going to give you a different example here to hopefully illustrate the difference between a statistically significant result and a kind of impressive effect size or an unimpressive effect size. So this is just some made up data that I've used for the purposes of this um, example. But what we're looking at here hypothetically is looking at the effect of a new therapy on anxiety and people's anxiety scores. And we've got anxiety measured twice. We've got anxiety pre, which is before the therapy started and then anxiety post, which is after the therapy is finished. And we want to see if this therapy will decrease people's anxiety scores. And what we can see here is that anxiety itself ranges from 50 to 100, again, hypothetically, but we've got a whole range of scores here about people's anxiety scores, and that anxiety scale is a scale between 50 to 100. And if you can see the different scores, so I've just calculated a different score for each of our people here, 
you can see that most people's anxiety decreases from pre to post. You can see most people have a negative difference score, but it's actually quite a small difference for most people. So most people have a score of negative one or negative two. There's a couple of negative threes, a couple of zeros. There's not a big difference in their anxiety score from pre to post, even though most people do have a decrease in anxiety. If we were to run the paired samples t-test on that particular data, then you can see that we actually do get a significant result. So we have a t-statistic of 4.5 and we have a p-value which is quite small, 0 0.0004. So you can see that we have a highly significant result, but a really, really small change, a very, very small decrease in anxiety. The mean anxiety change is a decrease of 1.1 units. So, and if we were to calculate Cohen's D in this instance, we would get a Cohen's D of 0 0.1. So the average difference between those two groups is 0.1 of a standard deviation. So it's a really, really negligible decrease, even though it's a statistically significant decrease. And the reason that it's statistically significant is because pretty much everybody's anxiety score does decrease. So there's very little variation in those different scores but it's a very, very small decrease. So if we were only looking at the statistically significant information, the information telling us that we have a statistically significant result, we could get quite excited thinking that this particular type of therapy is very useful, but it's actually not particularly useful because it has such a tiny effect on people's anxiety scores. And there's a lot of things, most of which we'll talk about at the end of the session. Um, there's a lot of things that can affect the statistical significance. There's a lot of things, including sample size, including variability, that affect the t-test and actually affect the p-value itself. Um, so just looking at the significance of a result is going to give you a biased representation of the actual effect you're looking at. What you need to look at more importantly is the size of the change or the size of the difference or the size of the relationship. And we can call that the practical significance or the practical meaning of the effects that we're talking about. That if I'm designing an intervention, say, to help people's anxiety score, it could be useful that I'm decreasing their scores. But if I'm only decreasing them by one point on a 50 point scale, then there could be a lot of other ways I could more efficiently go about helping their anxiety that's going to have a bigger effect. And as I said before, I'm going to be talking about effect sizes every week now between now and the end of the session. So um, we're going to use the information that we can get about the size of the effect in conjunction with the interpretation of the significance of the effect in order to be interpreting the results of any of the data that we're looking at. So um, at the risk of repeating myself a number of times, which I know I have, it's a really, really important thing to think about the size of the effect um, because that often gives us much better information than just the significance of an effect. There's a lot of things that can affect the significance, whereas the effect size itself is a more robust measure of what we're actually investigating. Okay, this slide is just a summary of two of the new commands that we've learned this week. Not particularly exciting compared to last week, but that's okay. Um, the first one is the Shapiro-Wilk test of normality, which we used as a test of the normality of the distribution of our different scores. And the second one is the actual paired samples t-test itself. Just a note while we're here that when I'm going through each of the lectures and I give you the status syntax, um, the idea behind that is not just for you to be able to write it down and to remember it, but hopefully to practice it yourself. So remember that all of the data sets that I'm using here, um, the ones that I'm using in terms of the main ones for the statistical tests, they're available to you online. And I give you that web use syntax um, where you can actually call up the data sets from the internet yourselves. So the best way of learning all of this stuff is just to get your hands dirty to play with it yourself. So all of the tests that I do throughout the lectures and all of the summaries that I run and the um, graphs that I run. If I give you the syntax, that means that you can run it yourself to see if you can get the same results as me. And that's the best way of practicing yourself in order to learn things yourself. Okay, so conclusions for today's lecture. Um, a lot of it was just recapping or kind of reiterating things that we've talked about last week. So hopefully um, some of the concepts that were introduced last week might make a bit more sense after we went over them for a second time today. So we've now covered three different kinds of statistical tests, three different kinds of analyses, our three different t-tests, the one sample t-test and the independent samples t-test we did last week, and the paired samples t-test was for this week.
So also, as I said to you last week, the things that are really important for you guys to know when we're talking about these statistical tests are when each test is appropriate. So under what circumstances would you use a one sample t-test versus an independent samples t-test versus a paired samples t-test? Obviously how to do it. So both how to conduct it by hand, but also how to conduct it in stata. And then how to write up the test results. So I give you an example of writing up the summaries of the results um, and I tell you all the different things that you need to include in those summaries. Things that we also covered today were effect sizes and confidence intervals. Um, and these are things that didn't just become relevant this week. It's just that we didn't really have time to talk about them in previous weeks. So these are things that can help us in our understanding of data that we've collected, but also help us to communicate the findings that we've collected, um, that we've analysed to a wider audience if we are communicating data. And again, um, I'll be talking about both of those things quite a bit more throughout the rest of the session. So that's the end of week seven. We've got halfway through the semester now, if you can believe it, halfway through all of the stats content that we're going to be talking about. And the next things that we'll be covering in week eight is a little bit of a recap of where we've got to up to now, plus a couple more examples. So look forward to week eight. Bye for now.